Hello and welcome, Rich B. Cotter, Rachel Linder, and our special guest, Jesse uh, Pines. Uh, and I have Jesse here for a very, very special reason. Um, Jesse now works for the uh, U.S. Acute Care Solutions, where he's doing national, he's the national director of clinical innovation. Um, he has a long history of contributing to the uh, emergency medical literature. Jesse, I've been uh, following you secretly uh, in terms of your career and your, your contributions, and they're, they're really extraordinary. You've done a lot of uh, work related to um, healthcare policy and uh, public health. Uh, I have here in the um, show notes your affiliations with uh, George Washington University and the Milken Institute and 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 of the like your credentials are uh, extraordinary and you were involved in a paper that has kind of got the emergency medicine community a little upset <laughs> it was entitled uh discharge errors in the emergency department a systematic review um uh, that when it's written in that version it doesn't sound like such a kind of hor horrible kind of thing but the New York Times had a little different version of the title of this of this paper, and that's where uh, it, it became kind of infamous, infamous, and where uh, where everybody started pushing back on this. So I think it was, it was September fifteenth that uh, this paper was uh, published in the New York Times, and um, it basically said ER docs are missing uh, cases where the uh, symptoms are, are are atypical. And uh, then they try to quantify all of this. Um, Jesse, you were involved in this paper uh, in, a, in a couple of different ways. Uh, would you kind of tell us what they were? Sure. Th and thanks for having me, Rick. So I was involved in two ways. I served as a technical expert um, on the on the paper, as well as a, a peer reviewer, um, but also just want to uh, make it clear that I, I did not, I was not involved at all in writing the paper and being a technical expert and a peer reviewer does not mean I approve of, of the paper. And I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about, about what that means. Um, you know, what, what, what that, the, what those roles meant is in, uh, I, I was a technical expert. I sat on a zoom call back in 2020 and gave some feedback on the methodology with some of the other technical experts. Uh, and, you know, at that time, I didn't think that their approach to, you know, search, searching the literature had, uh, was, was, uh, had any problems. Um, when I also served as a peer reviewer, which meant that I uh, gave some written comments back in 2021 on a draft of the report. Um, at that time, I was very critical of, a number of aspects of the report, in particular, how medical errors were defined um, and how we see medical errors in the emergency department versus how the authors were seeing medical errors in, in their report. Uh, and secondly, with, with some of the national estimates uh, that I, I, I didn't think that uh, there was uh, sufficient um, data to really extrapolate uh in, in in a way that they had and i i wrote those in my um in, in my peer uh reviewer comments and you know though you know those the, those particular areas i thought were not were not addressed so that was that was really my my role in this the introduction to this report for many people was this article in the new york times we're, and then you go back and look at the actual article uh, itself, and it is not an article like you've ever seen before or that you're expecting to see. It was really a tome. It was, um, let me look at some numbers here. Oh, yeah, it was uh, 744 pages, although I must admit all, about only about 115 of them were were um, the, meat, the, meat, the meat of it. There were lots of uh, summaries of what the paper showed uh, paper by paper by paper toward the end. There were 222 references. But there were so many people involved in this. It's one of those things where um, if how could how could we any of this be wrong 
or or any of it be substantively wrong. There were 15 authors. Uh, David Newman Toker was the uh, first author, and there there were these committees of helpers like uh, the uh, peer reviewers and the, and the technical experts to help them formulate the three questions that they were going to look at uh, in terms of medical error. And they talked about this huge pool of articles that they that they went through uh, t- to find papers on medical error. They went through all these insurance company databases and white papers also to look for uh, medical error and to, and to mesh all this stuff into um, uh, uh, some type of, of paper that could talk about what is the nature of the medical error, uh, um, uh, consequences of that medical error, how it may be prevented, those kinds of things. And so I thought they're, 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 um, what they were attempting to do was extraordinary. And um, this, just by the fact that they had 744 pages, I was impressed. Rick, before we get into the methodology a little bit more, I'm just going to out myself and say, uh, you know, this came out December 15th and I was Christmas shopping and um, doing lots of stuff with my kids and wasn't really aware of this until you emailed Jesse and said, let's talk about it. And I bet that there are lots of people listening who don't really know why it's controversial or why we're talking about it or didn't hear it on the New York Times. So can we just talk about some of the conclusions and kind of, um, you know, why this even got in the news before we dig into the methodology a little bit more? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so I'm just going to pull up the main points uh, and kind of the why it kind of became sensationalistic, I guess. So basically what they said, and this is just uh, literally summary of the main points that they have on the HRQ website, uh, that they said that. In the ED, patients receive an incorrect diagnosis 5.7% of the time. They suffer an adverse event 2% of the time, and 0.3% of those have a serious adverse event. And then that overall, that translates into one in 18, one in 18 ED patients getting incorrect diagnosis. Um, there's a bunch of these, so I'm trying to pick out the ones that were the most um, egregious, I guess. Um, let's see. Well, you know, they, they, yeah. One in 18 received uh, an incorrect diagnosis. One in 50 re- uh, suffered an adverse event and one in 350 su- suffered a permanent adverse, uh, uh, disability or death. So it's, so the re- bad number is one in 350, which is some, something like 0.3%. Um, uh, three out of a thousand patients. So, um, if he's, you yeah. know, so, so maybe patient, that's good enough. This, this may be, you know, her happening every week that some patient ha- has experienced a potentially serious out, uh, outcome as a result of a misdiagnosis. It's all, you know, volume dependent. Yeah. So, so maybe that's enough that that error rate was higher than anybody wanted to hear. It, it basically came out to something like uh, 370,000 patients a year, which is 0.3% uh, of the 130 million people who go to emergency departments. And they thought that was a lot of people to have serious errors um, uh, occurring. Right. Agreed. And any thoughts there? Yeah. I mean, I, I think when you look at the those numbers, they defy belief, right? So as emergency physicians, can you believe that 250,000 people a year die from our errors? It, it, it's it, it's unbelievable because I don't think it's correct. That's, I think that's the problem. And if you think about where that would put er- our errors in, um, in the list of, you know, you know, why humans die in the United States, um, that, that puts us behind, um, heart disease puts us behind cancer. Um, uh, uh, but it, it also puts us in front of 
accidents, diabetes. Um, it, uh, it also puts us behind COVID. I mean, it just it just doesn't make doesn't make sense that if this was such a such a big problem, that there there would be more observable um, clinical cases, um, that we, we would hear about. So it, it, to me, I think the number just didn't have face validity because I, I think the way it was calculated was, was based on studies that you, you can't really, you, you, that you can't really extrapolate, um, the, you know, that, that was basically the, the 250,000 and the 375 was, was based on three studies um, outside the US, uh, one from Canada, another from Spain, and another from Switzerland that looked at, you know, different populations of patients with different inclusion criteria, defining errors in different ways. And, um, you know, my, my argument as a peer reviewer was that, you, you know, yeah, if you zoom in on, each of those individual papers, it's it's interesting to to look at what the findings were, but you you can't really put it all together and then extrapolate to the United States um, be, because of the time period, the the way they define medical error differently. It just it just didn't make any didn't make any sense, and ended up with a number that I think is just incorrect. Yeah. So, uh, a- go ahead. I was going to say ASAP, and I guess I don't know. Pretty much a long list of organizations basically wrote a letter uh, criticizing the methods and questioning the conclusions. And in that they pointed out this, the fact that a lot of these studies or at least a number of them were derived from other countries. And one of the things they pointed out were that those other countries, I think Switzerland and Spain being among the two didn't have emergency medicine training programs. And so, you know, you're, if you're trying to, look at the state of emergency medicine in the U S to use countries that are have emergency departments that are staffed by non-emergency physicians. It's, it, you know, you're kind of starting from an invalid, uh, foundation. That was one of the points they made in that, that letter. I think that's the, uh, the crooks of the matter. Uh, they made the assumption that the countries of Western Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, those places, that their emergency care was uh, comparable to the care delivered in the United States. Um, it, it's a, unfortunate that the goal of this paper was to talk about the United States and the error rate in the United States, but they had data from uh, other, other countries. And I think that um, in this country, we would uh, challenge uh, um, the training of the people in, in the other countries in terms of whether they had a residency, what that residency was like, et cetera, et cetera. So I think one of the sources of uh, Ajira in this paper is um, they used papers that were not from this country to talk about what's going on in this country. Correct. And and then the other issue is really the the timing piece of this. I mean, if you could think about, you know, Rick, over your career, how much has emergency medicine changed in terms of our approaches, the various tools that we have, you know, even comparing, you know, 10 years ago, the rate of, of missed uh, acute myocardial infarction, uh, which was quoted in the study at 1.5%, 1, 1. you know, with high sensitivity troponin, that that's probably significantly lower high sensitivity troponin has only been around for a couple of years. So to say, you know, what's happening in late 2022, 2023, you know, versus what even happened 10 years ago, it, it, it's hard to make uh, those, those, those national extrapolations. And I, and I think, you know, for, for those of us who, you know, were around back in um, 1999, when the original to air as human study came out, you know, and sort of to similar, you know, they, they quoted a number of, I think, you know, 99,000 deaths, deaths a year related to medical error. And actually that paper sparked the whole patient safety movement. If you remember before that, you know, we weren't talking as much about patient safety, but you know, that, and then that number, 
99,000 was quoted thousands and thousands of times in you know, people's grant proposals in the peer reviewed literature. It was the first sentence of, of you know, more than a thousand papers. But when you actually went back and looked at that number and how they calculated it, they said, gee, you know, if we had, if we had, you know, changed the, the parameters a little bit, maybe it was 400,000, maybe it was 20,000. Uh, you know, because because it was so so the the, the number of, itself of of you know sort of taking a, a few you know even well done prospective studies and then sort of taking that percentage and applying it to a national number is is just it just not a, it's not a robust approach to to make a national estimate. So I you know I I, I sort of look at that to where is human number. In the same way that I look at this two hundred fifty thousand number, it's you know it, it, it's an it's an estimate with a confidence interval that could be, you know, uh, you know could you know may, may, maybe it's ten times off, maybe it's fifty times off. We, we we just don't know because because you can't scientifically do it. Yeah, a couple of other numbers that were interesting from their their methods. They said that. 137 of the 209, 279 studies they actually included were not from the U.S. So 137 of the 279 were from other countries. And then 64 of their studies were from before 2011. I don't know why they chose that particular cutoff, but so giving you an idea of the, the dates on those. Uh, another point that they made in the ASAP and other societies' letters, I don't know why I keep only pointing out ASAP, but was that the idea of even pointing to misdiagnoses is really off because in the emergency department, we're really doing more stabilization. Diagnosis is often not our goal. And so using that as a marker itself is, is really missing the point. And so I was curious, Jesse, you thought a lot more about this paper than we did. Um, you know, what your thoughts are on that, having, having spent more time thinking about it. Yeah, I, I had similar criticisms. Um, so, you know, and just to take you through three cases, let's say a patient comes in to the emergency department, has uh, nausea and vomiting and tachycardia. We don't know exactly what's wrong with them. And they get admitted and later they get a diagnosis of cancer, or maybe it was a little early sepsis or, or whatever it was. And, you know, 24 hours in, but we, you know, we, we identified that they needed to be admitted. Uh, so that's, that's, that's case one. Uh, case two is a patient who uh, had, comes in with some uh, substernal chest pain uh, that's caused by reflux um, that we, we assign a diagnosis of chest pain to. Uh, and then case three is is someone who has a has a diagnosis has a chief complaint of dizziness and vertigo, who we discharge from the emergency department without a whole lot of testing and has a stroke two days later. So take those take those three cases. I I argued that really only the the third one would be one that I would say you know we should really look at that as a, as a medical error that when when they we, when they looked at those two cases they said no according to the National Academy of Medicine uh, definition of medical errors all of those are, are medical errors and my my response to that was well that's you, that that's just sort of demonstrates a misunderstanding of how how we think about the world and the role of of emergency medicine. I mean, we, we can't make de definitive diagnoses for a, a lot of different things in the emergency department, but it doesn't mean that we're making a misdiagnosis. Um, you know, if we send some, someone who has a stroke two days later, I think none of us would argue that, you know, maybe we, we missed something, you know, we may have missed something. Um, but you know, and, and that's gotta be looked into. So I, I think that that was the issue is this, this definition of, what a medical error was uh was was a little shaky you know for you know for example some of the some of their papers looked at you know the diagnosis that that was assigned in the emergency department and then said you know looked at the diagnosis that was assigned in primary care 
which they was used as the gold standard of, you know, obviously if primary care set, says something that, that that must be truth and and sort of made a comparison and said, look, you know, some sometimes we're not, that there was a discordance there. I also don't really think that that's a medical error unless unless you actually have some gold standard test to say that 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 you know that that that, that you know that diagnosis is correct. So, you know, the the you know stepping back, I mean, the the literature is very thorny in terms of all these definitions. So, you know, the the interest in you know what we can learn, I think, comes from looking looking at these studies in isolation and what we can learn from them, um, as well as looking, sort of stepping back and looking at some of the big qualitative themes. I, I think that that's where really the value in, in uh, you know, and w- w- why we shouldn't uh, necessarily throw the whole thing out. I mean, there, there's some major problems with it, but I think there's also some major uh, takeaways that we should, um, you know, that, that, that we should look, look to um, as, as a specialty from this. Yeah, I agree uh, very much with that, that, that these p- people, I don't think are, you know, they, some people think they're doing, trying to do a hatchet job for some reason, but I, I, don't, I personally don't think that. Um, if you believe what they say, uh, here's the statement that uh, about, um, uh, it says the ED is one of the most challenging clinical settings to practice medicine that just 5.7% of patients would be misdiagnosed, just 2% would suffer some sort of adverse event as a result, and only 3%, 0.3% of patients would suffer serious harms from diagnostic error is a testament to the skill and capabilities of practicing emergency uh, physicians. Um, it should be remembered that, as you mentioned, not all diagnostic errors are preventable, and attempting to prevent some errors may lead to undesirable, unintended consequences that could adversely impact patients. Nevertheless, substantial variation in diagnostic uh, diagnostic errors rates do occur. Did it? Did it? Did it? Did it? So I think the preamble of it is is that you know three out of a thousand uh, having um, a serious uh, ad, uh, adverse events. Um, we all know that there is there is a number, uh, and we all know that we should try to make the number smaller. And and um, when you get into the weeds in some of this, there are some good good points about you know um, people who are more likely to have adverse events, like uh, women and the elderly. They talk about all kinds of interesting things which may in fact be true and if they are true it should be it basically be something uh that we can be aware of to try to limit the uh, uh, us causing mistakes like they list the most common sources of error uh, and uh, and the diagnoses that are most often associated with error and it seems that you know one of the things we could do is say okay well here are 10 that are most often associated with error. I had to try to study about these because what we're not talking about the typical presentations. They're talking about the atypical presentations and that we some, sometimes miss them. Um, so it seems that th- this it could be a guide to trying to increase our cognitive knowledge about because th- that's what they're claiming that these are fail- failures to diagnose because you didn't put two and two together and you got you know you got five and that um because it wasn't a typical case and that typical cases uh, are, are 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 usually picked up so i i think there is things there are things in this, in this paper that are of value uh, but you, when you do agree that there is value, then you have to agree that um, some of their statements may be, um, uh, you might have some argument with, but but others that seem reasonable, uh, you wouldn't. And I've never seen a paper like this ever in terms of its um, depth and um 
and and their ta- attempt to do the work that they're doing here. So there is value, I believe, in going through this paper. I, I think right now very few people have read the 170 pages of this thing yet, or 115 pages of the of the of the bulk of the paper. Because like one of the things that we don't know is, well, how many people are in this the stu- these studies? You know, the American studies versus the non- non-American studies. I think the index in the back tells you that, but it doesn't. You have to. You'd have a lot of work finding out because they review each study of the 222 that they're basically uh, uh, referencing here in terms of um, numbers of people involved and how they were diagnosed, et cetera, et cetera. So I bet we're talking to one of the few people who read the full 115 pages. Yes. I read a lot of it, but not. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't claim that. I mean, it is dense. Not, if you have any trouble sleeping, man, you just take a. Few. No, not you. Not you. <laughs> what, me? No, Jesse. Well, he was a peer reviewer. Have to. Yeah, I did read it. Yes, I agree. So, what were your takeaways from it? So, I think there are four big takeaways, and some of those Rick has already mentioned. Um, you know, there, well, so there are certainly many more than four, um, but the, my, my big four takeaways are, you know, one is the list of, of, uh, malpractice sort of hotspots and, you know, wh- why do we get sued? Um, and the, the, that, that particular list of diagnoses that, you know, includes, you know, stroke and am I, aortic dissection, spinal abscess. I think that's that's a really useful list to to take a look at because mm-hmm. that that's an area where we should probably be thinking about creating uh, clinical protocols around a diagnosis um, to make sure that we are um, a- approaching those those very common conditions um, in in similar ways. Um, I think there's also some use in in looking at sort of the the how often things are are missed within those within those categories. So you know, for example, you know, am I? They quoted it was you know one and a half percent miss rate, which I still is a number I don't believe because we got high sensitivity high sensitivity troponins now, and and it's um, you know I think we're probably be- better than we ever were at detecting that. Uh, but but then you take spinal abscess, where the rate in the literature is about 50-50 in terms of how often we're we're, we're missing those. So I, I think really looking at those those conditions and you know is this something that are it is missed frequently or infrequently? Um, you know you know and and it's often I think based on the the proportion of you know people who get definitive tests in the emergency department for these. So for, you know, anyone with chest pain is, is getting high sensitivity troponins these days, people with dizziness are not getting MRIs, uh, for, you know, frequently. So really, you know, coming up with protocols to discriminate who actually needs one, who, you know, who has those risk factors that who getting that, early MRI to rule out a spinal abscess or other, other cause of cord compression. I, I think that that's an area we should really focus on. And two is, is around atypical presentations. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the conditions that sort of create atypical presentations. Um, the, you know, and, and it is those malpractice hotspots and, um, you know, though, the, so so again, the, the, those areas are making sure that those atypical presentations are really baked into the those algorithms in terms of how we approach those patients. Um, you know, number three is is around um, the causes of error, and again, you know, one of the points of confusion I think and is it, the conflating sort of the diagnostic error rate with with malpractice. Um, so, you know, in order to have a malpractice suit come, you need basically three things. You need 
you know, something bad happened to the patient. There was an alleged breach of the standard of care and some attorney thinks there's going to be a big payout, right? So you need those three things for that to, for a malpractice case to come. And then you've got this other thing called a diagnostic error. Um, you know, the, 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 there, there's some overlap there, but it's not, it's not perfect. Um, but, you know, I, th- I think realizing that we, you know, we get sued for atypical presentations of these malpractice hotspots is, is, is really the, the sort of a starting point for, 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 for where we should, you know, be focusing efforts on, on trying to improve the way we, the, the way we uh, approach diagnosis. Um, I, I think another area is in uh, the causes, you know, for the most part, the most common cause, you know, when you look at a lot of these studies are clinical judgment, you know, what, what I'd like to call thinking problems, um, you know, in, in terms of what, what causes error, you know, other things are, you know, think communication, documentation, you know, other issues, but, but sort of th- thinking errors are, are when you look at malpractice cases are the, mo- the most common root cause, um, you know, if, if we're, you know, and, and you, and you sort of think about the process of us, you know, someone comes into the emergency department has, tells us a couple things. We do a physical exam. We look in the EHR, which is a mess, you know, and we order some tests and we, we, you know, th- th- I mean, that, that process is incredibly reliable. Um, but, but we, we, you know that breaks down when when you know one, one of those processes of it, it sort of breaks down in terms of us either you know thinking through the case it misinterpreting something so I, I think again that's where really protocols can help if you you know if you can take a you know a, a protocol around spinal abscess and say okay here are the red flags that you should check these boxes look at this. Make sure on every back pain you're doing a complete physical exam, and here are those features you should look at. If if we do that, we're we're probably gonna uh, and and document that on the chart. We're we're probably gonna have fewer misses for for spinal abscess. And, and then the fourth area, br- briefly, you know, is is uh, the concept of which I think is a great idea. It's called Spade, which is sort of symptom pairing. Um, when, where you take a, uh, a, a case of a stroke that comes in and you look back and you say, you know, was there, was there a visit for dizziness within, you know, seven days, fifth, you know, a week, you know, what, was there something that sh- that was missed there? And if there was, then go look at that chart very carefully for that first visit and, you know, and take a look at that and say, what was something missed there? Um, so the, yeah, again, the, that, that was sort of a long, uh, but you know, th- those were my four takeaways. So, you know, perfect. I have two questions that came up while you're talking. One's an easy one ish. Uh, you know, two things on your list of these top, the most common conditions leading to malpractice claims are stroke and spinal cord compression. That's number one and number four. Both of those to me, we miss because we're trying to not get an MRI. Why is it that nationwide you can't get an MRI in the ED? Like, I, I don't understand that. And the C, I mean, you can, but it's, you know, a process. And why can you get a CT, you know, in five minutes, but the MRI is such a process? it's culture, the medical culture. I mean, our, when I was a resident, it was hard to get a CT, you know, right. my residency, you know, the, the radiologist wanted to know what the abdominal exam was before they were right. going to do the CT. Uh, now, you know, you just sort of click CT and it happens. Uh, right. it's, just, it's just the culture of, of how we approach things. Um, but here we are trying so hard to not get an MRI when that would give us our answer, you know, and it gets us in so much trouble. All right. So that's more rhetorical, but, uh, the second one is you mentioned, you know, we're getting ourselves in trouble with these atypical presentations of fairly common things. And so one of the solutions you mentioned was to, you said, you know, bake the atypical presentation into the algorithm. But to me, that seems a bit paradoxical and, you know, not along, it makes sense, but 
also, how do you do that? Like, do you have examples of how you do that? And one of the things I find like an example that comes up, not maybe uncommonly, but I haven't figured out a way to bake it into the algorithm would be say a, a young female with ACS symptoms who you want everyone to think about something like SCAD, uh, a spontaneous coronary artery section. You know, we know this is a a thing. We want people to think about it, but frequently they don't think about it. And so they blow off the young female with these symptoms. They don't get the appropriate testing. They get discharged. I mean, you could think about it for, you know, somebody with no stroke risk factors who has stroke symptoms, who then goes home and has undiagnosed stroke, anything, but how do you actually take an atypical patient and get them into the algorithm? It seems a bit paradoxical actually, because the algorithm, it seems like is meant to weed out those atypical people. Well, when you look back at some atypical cases, I, I think there there is sometimes something something in there in that case on that first visit that may have been, let's say, a mild or moderate risk factor that was that was overlooked. Um, you know that, and you know we know we know that you know sometimes that sometimes that that does happen where you know someone has has lower back pain, um, and, you know, fi- you know, it has, uh, you know, no, no signs of cord compression seems like musculoskeletal symptoms. Uh, you know, five days later, they're diagnosed with a, a, a spinal abscess with cord compromise. And people say, you know, look at that back pain visit very closely. And they say, you know, was there anything at that visit that we, that, should we, we could have looked at, um, you know, what was it that we didn't do a proper, you know, physical exam that, that, you know, was it that, um, we didn't ask whether or not there's any history of IV drug abuse? What, what was it something in that initial visit, some fact, you know, some risk factor that is associated with spinal abscess that ha- had we done a, really thorough assessment that we would have, we would have figured that out. Um, and, and that's, that, that's really what it's all about is it's, it's, it's around standardized, you know, we, 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 you know, we, we know where, you know, basically this report tells us where this, they shows us the minefield, right? Here are the landmines that you can step on. Right. Um, and and I, I think that if we, if we take a, a, um, you know, an algorithmic approach to assessing conditions that can, that are potential landmines that, that that's really all we can do. So just design the approach so that as long as it's universally applied, it will catch those patients. We're not, we're not kind of stereotyping the patients out of the algorithm. It's, and it's not, it's not going to, it's never going to be perfect. Right. It's never, ever going to be perfect. And, you know, people who, don't have any risk factors for spinal abscess end up getting a spinal abscess too. Um, but, but, the, but, but, you know, the best we can do as emergency physicians, I think is, is to, is to, you know, is to understand where, where, where the line landmines are and making sure that we're, we're doing complete evaluations. And that brings me back to one of the things Rick mentioned when he read those percentages, you know, that 2% adverse event rate is actually essentially our goal when we design decision rules and such like uh, the heart pathway with a major adverse cardiac event is 2%, right? That's what we're going for. And when we're doing D dimers and stuff, I have to read that one again, but I think it's like 2%. That's what we're going for. That's kind of the risk tolerance that we have in emergency medicine. And so here we're reading Hey, actually, in this report that everyone is reading as a scathing review, we were at 2% adverse event rate. That's pretty darn good. So um, I think the other way to look at it is we're kind of achieving our goals. And, um, you know, that's just our risk tolerance. And maybe this will help us. We get into, you know, a malpractice case and we say, you know what, there is just a 2% adverse event rate. That's just where we're at. That's the best we can do. That's that's how it happens in the emergency department. So it's just imperfect. Yeah. And I think another way, I don't know if you've read uh, Daniel Kahneman's books, but the, the, another way to look at it would be that we, that we're, our, our error rate is, you know, is uh, uh, error rate is uh, 1% and our correct rate is, is 99%. Um, you know, if you, if you think, you know, the, the, the a survival rate of 
of 99% or, or mortality rate of, the, of 1% is the same thing, but it just depends upon how you frame it. Yeah. You know, I didn't read uh, this as a um, an attack on emergency medicine at, at all. I just think that they tried to lay out the facts using data that may be uh, assailed in some ways uh, and definitions that may be challenged in some ways. But the tone of of their uh, of their uh, writing, I don't think, is like accusatory or you got to do better or it's horrible kind of thing. Yeah, that's the kind of the way it came up in the New York Times. But when you read the paper, I, I mean, I think they're relatively careful about not overstating the case. Um, uh, in in turn, the pushback by uh, ASIP. Uh, uh, let, let me see what they had to say here. I have it uh, here. Uh, okay. In addition to making misleading, incomplete, and erroneous conclusions from the literature reviewed, the report conveys a tone that inaccurately characterizes and unnecessarily disparages the practice of emergency medicine in the United States. So says Christopher Kang, the president of the college. Uh, as we all, as with all medical specialties, there is room for improvement in the diagnostic accuracy uh, of emergency care, Dr. Kang added. All of us who practice emergency medicine are committed to improve care and reduce diagnostic errors. But honestly, I didn't really see the, any kinds of disparaging statements in, in, this, in this tome. I think they would. They would probably were care particularly careful not to do that. Um, although one of the reviewers of this paper said, "You know, here's another uh, hatchet job by uh, by our author uh, friend here, and that he, that implying that there's a reputation for this." I don't. I don't. I don't find it. You know, there's another fact that, that we haven't talked about. More than fifty percent of the patients were seen prior to two thousand. Um, and that kind of get, gets you a sense of, well, how many people were in these studies? Uh, they, they, the minimum number of people that could be in a study that they uh, added into their pile is 50 patients. Well, 50 patients is not much. And, you know, uh, some studies had 1,500. Well, it's, it, it's, uh, it's good to know that, but, uh, but it, it's really hard to find here. Um, I think we just have to have thick skin like usual and, you know, there look you at it for opportunities for improvement of, you know, we always know that there are those, we can definitely diagnose strokes better and, you know, everything else on the list that we talked about. So, yeah, I mean, they make it very clear that we need to do better with dizz dizziness. And, and if you were to ask me, yeah, I would need to do better on dizziness. Um, I, I think that's one of the more feared complaints in the emergency room because there there may not be a nice clear pathway to go down and if we developed a pathway I, I think we would feel more comfortable with it my takeaway from this is to push for easier access to emma uh to mris well they mentioned uh that uh of the of the 470 some uh comments the vast majority were yeah, they missed my ulcer when I went to the emergency department, and now look what happened to me. That, that was honestly the vast majority of people telling you the stories of 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 misses. Nine there some, months later, there were some nice um, uh, responses, like uh, written obviously by emergency physicians to some of these um, con concerns. And um, but one pa patient pointed out that. Um, the e, uh, ER at Harvard has a MRI in the ER. And so why can't everybody else? And so somebody went through the math mathematics of about $5 million times 5,000 emergency departments would be uh, some $250 million or something like that. But the idea was that we we don't have the instrument that will, will um, diagnose some of these problems that we're looking for. And Rachel, I, I really believe, and I think I've said this a bunch of times before, 
when we need that machine, we need that machine. And basically, the, the, they, they take the elective patients who are going through there, and they stop, and they stick your patient in, and, and that's it. I mean, we used to, that's, that's not a hard thing to do. Um, yeah. Yes, it's not available at night. That's true. We're, we're in community hospitals. But during the day, now that we didn't have a tech who would come in at night to do a MRI, uh, I mean, it was a kind of a big deal. But when you need it at night, you need it at night. Yeah. Hey, Rick, Jesse's going to have to go. So I don't know if he has any final words for us. Yeah, just just to get back to ASAP's comments. I mean, I, I think that ASAP's letter was spot on um, in terms of identifying some of the concerns. Um, you know, Rick, Rick, to your point, I, I, I think the tone of the of it was um, not necessarily unnecessarily d- disparaging. Um, so the tone wasn't disparaging, but what I think was unnecessarily disparaging was putting out a number that was incorrect and and to the public and uh, and then having New York Times and CNN, broadcast that number um and scare people about you know when they have their emergency you know am i going to be one of those six percent of people where they're going to make some mistake or am i going to be one of that two you know one of the two hundred fifty thousand people who die if i if i go into the hospital that that i think was the the con that we're unnecessarily disparaging um that came from and you know i i think also it came at a time when it, this is sort of the the wrong time to be bashing, you know, the emergency department. If you can see it that you know that way, with mm-hmm. our, you know, we're we're just recovering from a pandemic. Our our the system is we know the system is falling apart. Things are getting increasingly crowded. There are no nurses. Um, it increasingly is horrible to work in the emergency department for physicians and for nurses and for patients to go in there, you know, because the because the of all the systematic dysfunction. So I th- I think that was the other concern is just this this was sort of came at the wrong time and had, you know, it d- didn't lead with the message of, of here's how we can improve. It led with the message where, you know, b- you know, be, be be afraid because a lot of people are dying here, which is which just was incorrect. So I, I I think that um, uh, you know to to summarize I I think that that, uh, that that there are some good things in the report but I think ASAP's letter was exactly written properly. My friend, Rachel, any thoughts? No, thank you so much for joining us and letting us put you on the hot seat today. Sure. Yeah. It's Thanks good so to much. See you again. Okay, so let's just break it off here. Jesse, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Rachel, as always, appreciate your your work on this and these. And you 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 generally look up things before and and um, and have things up your sleeve that we don't know about until you, you play your cards <laughs> uh, because you do your research so surreptitiously. While while we're talking, she's looking up. You know, I'm gonna you know. But that I think that's one of the um, characteristics of a uh, of a millennial. Don't, don't call me a millennial. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, uh, right. Jesse. Uh, uh, Rachel, take care and have a have a. I hope you have some time off over the holiday. This is coming up. Uh, uh, as usual, this is extraordinarily late. This is being recorded on December twenty ninth, and. Uh, This is the December issue, but our heart is in the right place. So thanks for listening and bye for now.